We're rolling. We'll we'll do it live. Fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> Classic. I'm having basketball withdrawals. This is like now what Monday? Now what do I do with my life? <laughs> with the game. Your favorite four days of the year over and you're contemplating why are you even still alive? Yes. My, your butt, you're going to finish out the rest of the tournament. Questioning my existence. And then take your dad's um, promoted hibernation pill. You go to sleep <laughs> until, um, it, he said week one regular season football, but then he realized he's the quarterback guru and had to be back for preseason. So he said preseason game one is when the hibernation ends for him. Well, see, I think you need like a pod, like a, you get in, you set the timer and you do like, Okay, NFL draft, you get like a temporary wake up. <laughs> NBA NBA finals. Wake up for wake a day. Up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you also need like these sensors. And I've thought about this. Um, you know, you, <laughs> Put you, a lot of thought in you, it. You, you need these sensors, right? And so you like program all your favorite podcasts and all your favorite st- statisticians and all those things. And they just infuse into your brain automatically. And you wake up with a fresh knowledge of all of the things. I'm I'm being an absolute expert on the transfer portal when I wake up. That's funny. Without having to know yep. what actually happened. And I think that would be... I'm sure there's somewhere you could sign up for them to implant, the, implant that into your brain these days. I've been saying I, uh, <laughs> more and more on that. You just get this little chip in there and you know everything. Shit, with medical science chip. these days. But, but you don't... Why would we need to do that when we have someone like Big Dog to just enlighten us in all the sports anyway? And I got to tell the people, Big Dog wants everybody to know he's going to be back on next week. No, he won't. Back on next week. He's got very important subjects to talk about. It's going to blow your mind, but it's something to do with women's basketball. We'll get to that later. But he's taking the week off in Miami. He's on a yacht right now, and he'll be back. His bandmates are flying in this week. Big things are happening here at the studio. He wanted me to be the messenger to America. He wanted me to let him know big things are happening. He's driving in a fucking Acura to Port Aransas. Not true. Miami yacht. Don't listen to don't listen to this guy. And this motherfucker is saying he's on a yacht in Miami. And <laughs> it's nothing could be farther from the truth. Like that man was shopping fucking deals for Port Aransas too. I mean, he ain't he ain't not oh, paying wow. for no yacht. All right, <sighs> he got a lot of nerve, and he also wanted everybody to know, according to Bailey, according to Bailey, who is the steward of his bracket, he's the only man in America to be perfect through the first the, the first two rounds. Well, is that right, Bailey? Still perfect. Well, <laughs> we I, have it confirmed, have say- and they apparently, according to Bailey. According to the big dog, they shot it one continuous shot, and he has a newspaper with the date in the video to show he shot the video, but he's perfect, but he's not going to release it until the last game's over, he said. Going to be a lot of cross dissolves in that end. Uh, yeah, well. Bailey also said, I, I tricked Bailey. I said, did big dog, I typo. said, did big dog get Oregon? And I knew Oregon lost, and he said, yes, he did, and... Bailey didn't know. Yeah, Bailey actually kind of fucked up his perfect bracket. We talked on the show last week about how he was going to pre-record the show, the the bracket. He does not have a perfect bracket. And, you know, it was funny, though, during the game saying, you know, he would start saying one team was going to win, and then the other team would start winning or take the lead and he'll be like well i'm actually not sure who yeah we're gonna have I to check take. with bailey i don't know or he's like super pissed that auburn lost to yale and then he goes well good thing i picked Yale." Well, yep <laughs> good thing i picked yale bailey, Why were confirmed, you for auburn bailey confirmed he had oakland first round yale well, let's you know. start with oakland i think that's the biggest upset of the first round i know probably that and yale were similar spreads but First of all, the games in Pittsburgh, what do they have in the water up there? Those games were absolutely absurd. That was the best location for games. We had, I think, two overtime games. We had back to back. Yeah, it was uh, Oakland. It was Oakland and um, NC State. NC State and then uh, Creighton, Creighton. Oregon. Yeah. And before that, the two days before that, we had the, uh, the Kentucky upset, which was absolutely nuts. I mean, that game, I was watching. 
normally, I mean, we watched pretty much all the games together this weekend, but that night I had a poker tournament because I had to play to try to win to go to Vegas, which I did fucking win. And I am 99% locked in to going to Vegas and playing. We'll see if we can jinx him. He's got his ticket locked in. It's pretty darn darn locked in. I think I'm going to be playing in the WSOP, but we were over there watching the game. We had a little TV set up in this cool little office and we had the four screens, although the, the TV was probably 40, 50 inches, probably, probably closer to 45 inches. And, so and you're watching the, f- on the, the four four-way? Ooh. We finally put the Kentucky game on the big screen for the end of the game. But I'll say this, you know, every time, and I don't know how much of the game, I'm assuming you watch the game. I don't know what Oakland's coaching staff does to instill the confidence in those guys. But every time it felt like Kentucky was going to win or hit a huge shot, Oakland responded. It was phenomenal. The game was the best top three game of the tournament. Obviously the biggest upset. You know, Oakland, Kentucky didn't play bad. Kentucky did not play bad. They were not good defensively, don't get me wrong, but that's been Kentucky all year. But Kentucky made big shots. Antonio Reeves Reeves was absolutely fantastic. Phenomenal. He had 27 points, big shot after big shot. I'll get to Reed Shepard in a second. That was pathetic. Yeah, I'm looking at the stats here. I mean, they were I mean, not good, but like you said, they didn't play terrible. That was well, 42%. The one that kind of hurt him was 9 of 28 from three, where he had Oakland going 15 of 31. They almost shot 50% from three. Well, and, so. and 10 of 20 of those threes were from Jack Golke. Yep. And I mean, this is my kind of kid, okay? 372 shots on the year, 364 of them are triples. So he took eight two-point shots on the entire season. It would have season. been way better if he – I have a feeling he probably tried to not take any. And, there, I mean, when you only shoot two, there has to be, like, you're not trying to take any twos, and maybe he got caught under the basket wide open and, like, had to lay the ball. No, no, up. he took eight. Three, 364 oh, it was eight, oh, it was eight out shots. of 372. Well, that's still almost – yeah, well, I mean, that's a lot. Think about this. This is what makes it wild. That's, this, like, one shot inside the arc every what? Three games. Yes. <laughs> you know, what makes it so wild is the way teams guard him are, you know, basically are running him off the three point line and making him drive. So the fact that he only took shot two, two or eight twos in the whole year is ridiculous. But also, when you watch him play, you realize, oh, this kid cannot fucking dribble. So yeah. it makes sense, right? Like it's got to be like an offensive rebound put back or you know, just an absolute straight line drive or a breakaway layup off a steal. Otherwise, he's not shooting a two. I would venture to guess that's the majority of what his twos were. But, I mean, it was crazy. That whole gym was going absolutely nuts. This is what March is about. This kid was 10 of 20 from three. He had 32 points against Kentucky. He hit seven threes in the first half. It was electric in that gym. He hit 16 threes in the two games combined, scored 54 points combined in the two games. And it was really cool when, I don't know if you caught this, but in the game, Oakland's coach in the first game against Kentucky, you know, they do like the little in-game interviews in the first half. Yeah. They they interview him and they talk about Golke. And I think he had hit like one or two at that point. And Greg Campy, who's been at Oakland for 40 fucking years, was like, yeah, he's... That guy's been there 40 years? Yeah. He looks pretty good for a guy there. He does, he does look yeah. really good. I would have uh, guessed he was like, you know, in his 50s. So. He does. He does look really good. But he... He um, was like, you know, he's one of the best shooters in the country. He's a fantastic player, and, and the world is going to see that tonight, which was kind of cool as he was saying that, and then he goes on to continue to hit three after three after three. That whole gym, he, they had the crowd. That's the special part about March. And the special part about March is, look, there was a joke going around after the game that this is, you know, Kentucky has these guys going to the NBA, and a guy is going to be a fucking insurance salesman is out there beating these guys. And I mean, I can relate to that. A lot of people can relate to that. That's why this tournament is so special. No other sport, I don't think, can you have something like that? Like, you're not going to have a guy like that in a football game because you have to be a great athlete to play football. You know, it's rare that you can get a guy who is not an athlete. The guy's only, I don't know, 6'3". I think he's 6'3". And be able to shoot like that the the great equalizer of the 21st century is the three-point shot and it's become 
Fantastic. Funny enough, he signed an NIL deal with TurboTax the day after. So Smart. That was fucking yeah. classic. Got to seize the, seize the moment. <laughs> but yeah, that's what makes this tournament so special. I, yeah, I mean, they should have beat NC State, too. I mean, it was, it was a good game. NC yeah. State went up around them early eight. They came back to tie it, had all the momentum, didn't get a shot at the end of regulation, lost an OT. Not I getting mean, a shot hurt. Yeah. Man. And then you have, you know, Townsend is their, their best player statistically, and he, um, it seems like, you know, it seems like he had a good game against NC State. I mean, you know, points-wise he did, but he was just 11 for 25, which I think he's usually a little bit better than that. It's not a, ba- really? not a bad game. Yeah, it was 11 to 25. Took 25 shots. So, Campy not terrible. Said, Campy said after the game, not to interrupt you, Campy said after the game, and I completely agree with him, and I want to get to his interview too. I know we're spending a little probably more time on this game because it was this team in general was the best story of the tournament. But after the game, he said, look, he got fouled a lot tonight. I thought he did, too. Yeah. And he goes, how many free throws did he shoot? And he picks up the stat sheet and it's like eight free throws. He goes, look, if that happened in our league, he would have shot 20. Yeah. So it's just, you know, and, and he's right. He, he guy got fouled all night long and they just didn't call it. And that's the NCAA tournament. The refs don't play to these mid-majors. Look at who we have in the Sweet 16. We have one double-digit seed, and it's NC State who's a Power 5 conference team. So it's just that's what happens in these games a lot of the time. Sometimes in the first round, you'll see officials play to the underdog if the crowd really gets behind a team. And I do think the crowd was behind Oakland against NC State. I think everybody who was neutral was rooting for Oakland. Oh, yeah. But... I think he's right. I think that that stat line really does actually back that up. Now, like he was just 11 for 25. It felt like he had a really good game. That's because every time he drove and missed, I was like, wow, they didn't call a foul there. That's crazy. Yeah, they don't call many fouls on old Burns, baby. Jesus Christ. That motherfucker. Little, little Shaq, second coming of Glenn Baby Davis. Gotta love him. That kid will never some, pay Got for... some sweet, sweet hands, baby. Throwing dimes to everybody. They, I will say this. I don't know why Oakland, the one thing to me is like, I get that Burns is good, um, but they doubled too much for my liking. You know, do it once every two or three possessions. They did it every time. And credit to him, he found guys that were just wide. I mean, they're crashing. There's guys wide open for three in the corner. And that's really what cost them a couple times late. And, you know, I think there's one big one in OT where that happened. So, but, uh, yeah, he, he they don't really call ever any offensive fouls on him. They let him kind of do what he wants. But, yeah, um, I, I agree with that. I want to see, um, I... I think what Campy thought was, you know what? This team is the 140th three-point shooting team in the country percentage-wise. Burns, we do not have anyone who can guard him one-on-one. And he just thought, you know what? I'm going to just stick to it over the course of a 40-minute game. We're going to make them beat us by making threes. The problem is they don't shoot it like horrifically. They're 34.7% on the year. And when you give their best three shooters you know, practice shots. I mean, that's what they were, right? Like these guys were wide open. They were helping off what, what my, my frustration I mean, with And the, when you look at the stats, there were only nine. I mean, I mean, so I guess in reality, it, it was worked. a good plan because they were only nine to 26. It's just the fact that they were just wide open. They were, yeah. but they were missing the majority of them. So I guess in reality, it did work. So, but the, but the and that's why the, I think it did work for the most part. Like overall, if you think about it, well, in regulation, if you're Oakland and you're campy, you're like, well, we got the ball with 17 seconds to go to win the game. So, yeah, you know, and, and he talked about this too in his interview, and that was that, you know, they had two other plays that if they go their way, they win the game. And he said the first one was with about a minute and a half to go, Oakland was up by two with the ball, and Trey Townsend ripped and went baseline and got shoved with two hands out of bounds and had to throw the ball to the the white kid, not Golki, the other little point guard, who yeah. wasn't bad either. He had to put up a tough contested three, airballed it. On the ensuing possession, I believe, NC State shot a three, and I didn't see this. You saw it because we were driving to pick up Texas Roadhouse at the time, and you were telling me what happens as we were going so that because I'm a responsible driver, and I don't text and drive or ever watch games. I never do that. And so never it's we're going like 45 miles an hour in the right hand lane. People are flying around us. I was like, man, maybe I guess I wasn't doing a good enough job on the play by play, which I wasn't. 
You I was just, I was just, no, I wasn't. I mean, I, like, I, mean, I was just being quiet and like watching Dylan will always give play by play. So I was like, oh yeah, they missed. They got the ball. And they're like, who are they just trying to look? But yeah, we almost got hit multiple times on 281. <laughs> and then when we left the parking lot, when it was an overtime, I was like, I don't know if we're going to make it back home. <laughs> we'd be watching the game going 40 miles an hour. Okay. To be fucking fair, we're driving and it's like, they've got the ball and I'm counting in my head. Okay. Like. 37 seconds has gone by and he hasn't said fucking word. Like, did they make a shot? Can you not tell a me good that? Play, not scored? a good play-by-play guy. No, not at all. Not as bad as Big Dog, but... Big Dog is fantastic. Big Dog was like, you know, talking about a player being in the backfield on talking, the basketball court. Yeah, he was talking shit about Dylan because he said he did it too quick because he was doing it like radio. He's like, sound like you're commentating the fucking horse race. You don't know what the fuck you're doing. And then he did it. He's like, oh, Bird's got it. Oh, puts it up. Misses. <laughs> Throws it in the backfield. Oh, wait. <laughs> I mean, backcourt. I got to put a, the clip of that up on on the podcast as we're going. It was hilarious. Oh, yeah. I forgot that you were filming. I was, filming was doing that. that. Was filming he's, that. Like, he's like, stop filming. And you're like, no, I'm not going to do it. So you shut up. He's like, fine. Fucking film me then. <laughs> but Kenny Powers Jr. over there. But uh, we were watching the end of that game. And that, that play that we were talking about, you did tell me what happened on this one. And that was NC State took a three at that point. And the ball never got, I mean, it was so flat. It never got 10 feet in the air. And it hit the rim at just a perfect point and bounced straight down to DJ Burns. And if it didn't go to him oh, anywhere yeah. else, they get the rebound up too with the Didn't minute. he get an and one too? I think he did. or No, I think he just tied it. There I, was another kid that drove when it was like a one-point game. That's what it was. It was a one-point game. The white kid. Oakland was up in a one-point game, and the kid drove and got an and one. And they went up by two. Then Golgi got fouled, made both. both. And then they got a stop. Got a stop. Burns missed, Burns missed it, and then they would have had a chance to win. I, they tried to get the ball to Townsend, I think, out by, like, three-point line. I'm like, what are they doing? Just well, throw it in so, deep. Okay, so, I, again, I watched Greg Campy's Yeah, what did he say about that? And he blamed himself. He goes, he goes, I got to live with this. Like, you know, I've been in that situation. I've coached 1,300 games in my career, which is, I think, fair. And he's like, I've been in that situation hundreds and hundreds of times. And to have it happen in the biggest moment is going to be hard to live with. But I actually don't think it was his fault. So, if you go back and watch the play – what actually what they were doing, they didn't try to get it to him out there. They were trying to get it to him at the left elbow. Uh-huh. And he was going to catch, rip, and go, which is what he's been doing the entire game. And he goes, one of three things was going to happen if we did that. He was going to score. He was going to get fouled. Or they weren't going to call a foul and he was going to get fouled. Because yeah. they hadn't stopped him doing it the whole game. The kid who was guarding him had four fouls. We knew that. And he had been scoring on that play or getting to the rim at will. And so he was on the left elbow. He was going to catch and rip back going to his left, which is interesting that he's better going left because he's right-handed. But what ended up happening is NC State just pressured the ball so much that it, it freaked them out, and the kid just kind of panicked. He needed Couldn't to take to two him. more dribbles over. But he goes, he said, you know, it's my fault because had we gone immediately, that doesn't happen. And we wanted to wait until eight seconds to go because we didn't want to give him, give him a last shot. And I'm like, dude, that's the right move. You you have to wait. What If, if you go early... And they get the rebound and go score. Then you're going to the press conference going, man, I went way too early and I cost us the game. I thought Campy did a phenomenal job. It was really cool, his interview, how real he was and explaining all those things. Yeah. You see all these bullshit interviews and they're all fake afterwards. He's a real dude. I lo- I'm, I've am i been inspired by that guy. Yeah. Um, he's a good coach. He's phenomenal. But, yeah, anyway, real quick question, real quick, back to Kentucky. Is Calipari on the hot seat one and four in the last five tournament games since 2019? They have not gotten out of the first weekend. They got to the Sweet 16. The last time they or got to the, the Elite Eight, the last time they got to a Final Four, I believe, was 2015. I think the answer is no, just because it's the climate we're in in college basketball now where you can't keep a team for four years. I know he's always been lottery guys, young guys, whatever. That's what Calipari's always done. Most guys have been there. You know, your John Walls, your DeMarcus Cousins, your Anthony Davises there and leave it and go but i just don't think you can fire a guy who constantly gets all americans and they're pretty good every single year and if you lose that's what makes the tournament so special it's one game right yeah like if uconn was playing anybody in the country in a seven game series i told someone this the other day there's not one team in the country that would force it to go seven games you come to winner six and less against everybody probably five or less against against all but two teams yeah I think no one takes them seven games. I think they'd win every single seven-game series in six or less. So that's what makes the tournament so special. I just don't think – 
I think he always gets the guys, you know, the highly recruited guys, and no one's looking. There might be a couple kids that are like, oh, they keep losing in the first round, but I, most of those kids are going these days, as you know, to play one year of basketball, get paid by the NIL, and leave. I mean, it's that simple. So yeah. I don't think he's in the hot on the hot seat because I just don't – who are – you know, I mean, I don't know who they would go get that's going to out-recruit them. Sure, you could go get a better at X's and O's coach, but no one's going to out-recruit Cal at Kentucky. So it's just like, I just don't think they can do anything. I mean, I even think that they could bust it out in the first round again, and then you would say that, okay, well, now he is on the hot seat, but they wouldn't fire him because I just don't think there's anything you can do in this day and age. Like, if he was keeping these te- guys for four years and, you know, He's playing with a bunch of seniors out there, and this keeps happening. I think it's a different story. But when you just keep bringing in new recruiting class after new recruiting class of young guys, and you have them for one year, and it's just really hard for me to grade someone on 40 minutes because Cal, we all know, is not a good X's and O's coach. Yeah. So if those guys' shots aren't going in, I don't necessarily think it's his fault. I don't think it's like – he doesn't have them ready to play. I mean, I guess you could make that argument, but I mean, they ran into Oakland where that kid scored 30 something points and just made his shots. And but, yeah, I don't know. Well, my, my, I have a little bit of an issue with how he conducts himself. You know, if after the games, if he took some responsibility for like, you know what I've done, a, I got to do a better job coaching because this keeps happening where, Yes, it's one game, but it's like Purdue. When it keeps happening over and over, there is a common denominator there. Like, you you can't ignore the fact that they lost to St. Peter's a couple years ago. They missed the tournament one year. They lost this year to a 14 seed. Like, this is starting to become a theme. It wasn't ever a theme for Cal. Actually, his teams normally have always done traditionally quite well in the tournament. He just never could get over the hump of winning a national title for a long time. Yeah. The last five years, it has flipped a little bit. Now, I think part of that is... NIL. Everybody else has one and dones now too. Everybody else can go pay and have the same level of recruits as Kentucky. They're not getting five of the top 15 players in the country anymore. They're getting a couple of them. You know, Antonio Reeves, their best player this year, was a transfer from Illinois State. So they're not recruiting at the same level they were. It's just impossible to do that nowadays because it's it's a more equal playing field. Yeah. But I just don't like how he's always like, well, my job is to prepare them for the he's NBA. He's very lackadaisical about it. Like, yeah, I mean, it's just, that's what he's always, that's always what he's, you know, for the last 10 years, that's what he said. I come here, get these kids ready for the NBA. That's and, bullshit. And if they win games, they win games. I agree. But I mean, bullshit. it's just, if I feel like Matt, that, why are you going putting your hands in your head like this every five seconds when your guys make a mistake and freaking out at them? You, that's not true. It's not true. You just can't win. That's the that, That's your default saying, I can't win and I don't know how else to coach. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think Painter's got it easier than him because guys, now Kentucky get better players, but Painter usually gets to keep them for four, three to four years. I hate Matt Painter. Yeah. I, I'd rather no, no, have No, I'm Cal. just saying, no, I'm just saying like in general though, like there's certain situations like Izzo, you know, typically those guys stay a little bit of time with them. Cal gets them for one fucking year and then they all leave. Yeah. There are exceptions to that, obviously, but I'm just saying in general, the guys that he gets are there for one year. And, you know, like imagine if those teams stayed together, like they always talk about, imagine, you know, if Anthony Davis, DeMarcus Cousins, John Wall, I forgot there's one other really big player. Yeah. That's even like imagine if they stayed together for three years and it's like, you know, would they have been better than, you know, the Florida team that won back-to-back championships that had junior and senior players on their team. True, so, but I mean, are those guys ever going there if they know that they have to stay for four years? So it's just, no. you know yeah, what I mean? they're not. I yeah. mean, but that, I mean, I just think that that's the situation is yeah, what I'm trying if, to say. If you're, yeah, no, I get what you're saying, right? If they're, if college game, if college, if the college system was like that where you had to stay for four years, yeah, obviously, probably they win two national titles, right? Like they're just that far and away more talented yeah. than everybody else. So I get that. Other upsets we had... Um, no, uh, we'll talk about the second round too. I'll go through some of the games that happened and then we'll go over and look at the Sweet 16 matchups. But we had an, almost no upsets. Really, we had one upset and one double digit seed win in the second round. But in the first round, we did have some big ones. JMU, although that point spread wise was only five and a half. So it wasn't a massive upset. But yeah, they get their first NCAA tournament win since 1983, 41 years since they did it last. They looked really good. Uh, Mark. Mark Byington, uh, is that his name? Mark Byington going to Vanderbilt. Yep. 
Shout out, Bailey. Big, big day for the, the Commodores. Big day for the Commodores. Although uh, Tyron Lawrence just entered the transfer portal, so that's no good. I also saw, and this is not basketball, but uh, briefly, that the uh, Titans got Sneed, huh, Bailey? There you go. Look Wait, at that. Things Sneed are looking from up. from the Chiefs? Yeah, for like a fourth-round pick. I thought they franchise tagged I guess him. they decided not to and traded him. That's idiotic. I don't yeah. understand that. Well, one. I guess the thinking on it is, he was probably throwing a fifth that he was going to be franchise tag, which doesn't really matter. I agree. You just franchise tag and make a play. But he's probably throwing a fifth that he's going to be franchise tagged. And they know money-wise there's zero chance to keep him another year probably is yeah. what the deal is. So they let him go for like a fourth. But, no, I agree. The Titans, Shit, if I'm gonna Titans got a way. Titans got a, you know, a steal. That's for a steal. Sure. If I'm, but if I'm going to restructure Mahomes' deal to try to, you know, win now, why not? Keep him for the year. I know you want to get value out of him, but he's that important to your team. Anyway, back to the... the Agreed. Update. Yeah, sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, Duke, uh, the Dukes, though, could not carry over the momentum after beating Wisconsin. They had to face the real Duke, mm-hmm. and the real Duke showed up in a big way. Jared McCain, with his painted funkin', fucking fingernails, uh, hit like eight threes against them. It yeah. was never close. I was hanging out with the family. I was going to come over to your house and watch that, and then saw that James Madison was down 30 points, and I just waited to come Stay over away. for that save, next game. Save your time. I said, I'm not going to watch that one. That was, that was a bloodbath. It was bad. I watched I watched the first half, and I, I tried to find some hope and, and find something in that game that might help them turn it around. But And speaking of the real Dukes, the real UT, the University of Tennessee, knocks off the Texas Longhorns. I know that made Bailey really happy. I, I sent him a text message, and he put some kind of – curse on me i don't know what it i is. said you deserve it's a curse. very scary picture it's like the pope doing something and then i'm like in the background I, and demented. there's a tennessee yeah i don't i don't i didn't like it at all big dog it was true detective ass. yes yeah i didn't like it bailey <laughs> the best is i told big dog he goes yeah he can be a little uh he could be a little uh what was the word he used i don't know it's funny vindictive he, he, yeah he's like he, he, he'll let you have it at times yeah. yeah he gave you a lot of confidence man i was i was surprised said he does good job smart kid but he goes sometimes sometimes he gets a little sassy yeah he, sometimes he, he gets a little sassy for me he was uh, he, i will say with his headphones on we were oh, watching God. the game and he would not we like we would say something to him i would be like hey bitch <laughs> and he would he's, not huh? respond yeah and and he like well, that kept happening, but he was like, for like a good 30 minutes. Oh my God, Bailey. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? Oh, Bailey, I'm going to fucking kill Bailey. I'm going to fucking kill him. Just constantly. Like, <laughs> and then, about the, and this then is I'm, not locked up. It's yeah, not synced. Wait, 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 wait. Let me whine, whine, And whine. then he's telling his brother to stop voice texting. And they're both voice texting, by the way. But cr- uh, big dogs going the entire time on it. He's like, Chip, quit voice texting. And it's like, Bailey, what the fuck is going on with this video? He would do this. What he would do is he'd be like, he'd go, Bailey, what the fuck? We need to fucking fix this. All right, guys, no more voice texting. No more voice texting. <laughs> like right away. I'm like, you're the one fucking doing it. I was like, no one else here is voice texting but you and Chip some, but mainly yeah. you. <laughs> we saw um, the Gales of St. Mary's. Man, did they look bad. Won the West Coast regular season. Won the conference tournament. Beat Gonzaga two out of three times this year, including in the West Coast Conference Championship. They lose in, it was kind of embarrassing how, how bad they looked. I will say, recurring theme here, the, the all-white teams are the ones that tend to get upset. We had BYU, Wisconsin. We had the Gales oh, of St. Wow. Mary's. All the You're big throwing white the white delegation on the, the... The white delegation had terrible, a bad man. weekend. You got to have a mix. We need some diversity on these teams, yeah. all right? We're not going to have... You're not going to go in there with 17 Mormons and take down Duquesne, all right? God loves the Dukes. That was another big upset. BYU big dog, the first big game dog, of the day. Big dog marks for diversity so these teams could have everybody play. God loves the Dukes. He doesn't love big dog, but he loves the Dukes. Second biggest upset of the tournament, Yale taking down Auburn. I was on the Yale Bulldogs, although they got taken back to reality last night. It was That was about as ugly a game as I've ever seen in the NCAA tournament. That happens sometimes. You get these uh, big upsets in the first round, and that team in the second round gets just absolutely waxed. They like just w- when those teams lose, they get slaughtered. Like they when they run out of gas, they really run out of gas sometimes. Obviously, that was a bad matchup for them with the physicality. But I do want to talk a little, just a second, about that game because it's important to discuss why Auburn lost. In addition to the fact that Bruce Pearl is a giant fucking moron 
I mean, that's an understood thing. He's horrible in the tournament. They've lost, I believe, in the first or second round almost every single year he's been a coach. The lone run to the Final Four, they should have lost in the first round. They were playing New Mexico State back in 2019, the year they lost to Virginia in the Final Four. They were up by two and fouled a kid on a three with two seconds to go. And the kid went one out of three, and he was like 84% on the year. It was just a fluke that he even missed one. Choking dog. And then they actually got the ball back and had a three to win the game and missed it. Anyway, regardless, Bruce Pearl does this every fucking year. A couple years ago, he had the number two overall pick, Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler on the team, and they lost to Miami a 10 seed in the second round. They just, this is what, this is what, oh, Bruce yeah, Pearl I does. forgot Walker Kessler is on the yeah, team. Yeah, but he plays for the Jazz, doesn't he? He does, and he's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, but, Chad Baker Mazzara, second leading scorer for Auburn, gets tossed with a flagrant two in the first five minutes of the game. Actually, Auburn lost two starters in the first five minutes of the game, had one go down to an injury. He did come back in. Then Mazzara, and it wasn't even, I mean, it was pretty darn clear. Like, it, there was, Bruce Pearl was trying to say it should have been a flagrant one, but I mean, the kid is running down the court. He cocks his elbow back and looks at him and bang right in his chest, pow right in the kisser. And Got the, pe- the people's elbow. I think it was uh, it was definitely a flagrant two, just because of the intent. Yeah, like if he does, like if he's if his head is this way and he just throws a flailing elbow and isn't looking where it's going, you probably get away with a flagrant one. But the fact that he like turns and looks and makes sure he he connects with the guy's. Chest. I'm just like, what an idiot. Yeah, that was like tossed. full on James Harden and Ron Artest. Meta World Peace. Or Meta World Peace. That's what I say. Please, like correct he, name. He pounds his chest and then looks at James Harden right here and then just fucking, I mean, could have killed him. Hit, hit him in the temple about as hard as you can hit somebody. Knocked his lights out. The bearded monster was down for the count. You don't fuck with Ron Artest, right? That's that's one guy you don't fuck no, with. No, you don't. But that's how about be like to, <laughs> everybody in the league? That'd probably be the last guy. <laughs> But that game was an unbelievable game. That was one of the better games yep. of the tournament we had. And Houston and AM last night was a crazy one. Yeah, so here, I want to go through this real quick. So real quick before I do, Pac-12 went undefeated in the first round. They, I believe, started the tournament off 6-0. Wazoo, Colorado, Oregon, and Arizona all won the first round. We had Colorado win in the first four, and then Arizona won in the second round, the first game. After that, all three of the other Pac-12 teams got knocked out. So we only have one left, but they yep. did still... Completely overperform compared to expectation. The Mountain West had six teams in. Boise lost in the first four. Colorado State, New Mexico, and Nevada all lost in the first round. Utah State got destroyed by Purdue after getting through round one. San Diego State's the only Mountain West team left in. SEC had a terrible showing. I think they went three and five in the first round. And I believe the only teams left now are Tennessee and who's the other one? Illinois, no, uh, not Illinois, they're Big Ten. Uh, Tennessee, and there's one other SEC team left, Alabama, which yep. is shocking that Alabama's left. Florida lost in the first round, Mississippi State, South Carolina, Kentucky, Auburn, all lost in the first round, A&M lost last night. Big East, 3-0. and Sorry, 6-0, and three teams still in. Um, okay, let's go through this, because I want to do this, and I think we'll hit on the Houston game here. So give me... what. Well, Give me the best game of the first round. What was the best game overall? Of the first, uh, or, or of, I'll, say, I'll say of the first two I'll, rounds. I'll say the best game. Well, there were some. There were some good ones, some crazy ones. I thought the best game, probably the best played game that came down the wire was Colorado Florida. Colorado Florida was fantastic. It's a hundred and two to a hundred. Yep. I mean, like they were just scoring. Defense went great. Both teams were scoring, and then he hit that game winner with the little shove. The little sho- Simpson. Simpson shoved and hit like a little. 15 footer from the corner that literally did like the Kawhi Leonard bounced off. It hit the rim, I think, six or seven times. And then I literally went in. said the exact same thing. That yeah. was a Kawhi Leonard shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, so. it, it, it hit the rim seven times, popped in, and Florida yeah. was out of timeouts. Brutal loss for the Gators. And I want to say this because I'm going to get to this in a second about the most disappointing teams, but Florida was more disappointing to me than a lot of teams. I thought this actually saved me. I would have had Florida probably going to my Sweet 16. They did not have a starter out, dude. I thought that Condon was out. He played. Oh. It was the backup big man that got hurt, who averaged five and a half points a game. Now, he's, a, he's a, a guy who plays 20 minutes a game, but that should not impact your team to lose in the first round. That was a really, really poor performance. Not, not that they, 
They played great offensively, but they gave up 100 points to a Colorado team yeah. that's averaged like in the 70s all year. I don't know what was going on defensively. They, they really shouldn't have even come back. They were down 10 with like two minutes to go and just had a miraculous comeback. I mean, like we've said, the Pac-12 looks pretty has looked pretty good, and Colorado was a team that surprised me because I hadn't seen them play much. And, I mean, they gave Marquette everything they could handle yesterday, too. I they mean, did. it was tied with three minutes left. And I think Colorado spotted him. I didn't Marquette go up like 11 or 13 to start the game. They yep. came all the way back. Yep. So Florida was up early on them too, I think. So they had some resilience fought back. I think we both think that Williams kids overrated, right? Is it uh, the Cody Williams? Williams. Cody Williams. God, yeah. dude, the Spurs are going to draft him. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I know how we think. I know how we fucking work. And our guys are salivating at those long arms. We see Kawhi Leonard Jr. He's a, athlete you can defend and the dude is gonna bust massively that would be a horrific pick if we pass on dalton connect and take that kid i'm gonna lose my fucking we should mind. draft wimby's like 16 year old brother does he have a 16 year old yeah, brother something like that he's like a 15 or 16 year old brother he's massive too <laughs> actually that would be pretty awesome the but is that gonna be boys. like a Giannis antetokounmpo thanasis probably type probably deal? i couldn't imagine him being as good obviously but my, my i thought the best game of the first first two rounds was the second round game between Creighton and Oregon. We watched that game together, went to double overtime. Creighton wins it in double overtime. Absolutely unbelievable game. Creighton was down four with 30 seconds to go. Tons of credit to Greg McDermott, man. The way he coaches his teams down the stretch and how well they execute and know what to do and don't panic. Like, they get down four. I think there was a, a 105 left, and we were like, sitting there watching the game together, like, can you really play this out? And he knew what he was doing. Like, he knew, all right, this is, like, a certain amount of time left. We're playing it out, I'm sure, right? Like, there's a cutoff for, for a guy like that who's very meticulous. Yeah. He knew we're playing this out. They get, they get the stop they need. They push it down. They score quickly. They call timeout out of the timeout. They execute their press to a T, and they force Dante, who's a 60% free throw shooter, to catch the ball. They let him catch it, face guard everybody else, and foul him immediately. He misses the front end of the one and one. They come down. They call timeout. They run a little set for Baylor Shireman. He hits a big shot, and then they get a stop at the end of regulation to send it to overtime. Obviously, I give Dana Altman a little bit of the blame. Should have called. I don't know if he had a timeout, but should have drawn something up. Maybe he didn't, but. Also, I when think that Dante, was out of a timeout. Oh, was it? I think well, it when was. Da, well, when Dante caught the ball, he looked over to the bench, and Dan Altman has his hands on his head, shaking his head like, "No, why was, did you get it?" He, to was, him? Like this. he yes. was like this. Yes, like he was not happy, and that that instills a lot of confidence in your guys. Well, here's what he did. That's where you got to go, Mac Brown, and you know, clap it up for him. Do the uh, Jason Garrett. Yeah. He, he, yeah, you know, it Graham. was funny because he was like collapsing on the sidelines and then he looks up and he's, he realized, oh, shit, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and then he goes, hey, it's okay. It's all right. Yeah, we're going to okay. make it. And he goes, Dante, Dante, free throws, free throws. Yeah. You got this. And then he misses the front end and they lose, you know. Well, in overtime, by the way, then Creighton had a shot to win it. And Trey Alexander got a look that he hits probably. 18 out of 20 times and missed it. Yeah. And it was funny. You saw Greg McDermott and Dana Altman, their friends. You know, Dana Altman coached at Creighton for a long time. Oh, yeah. And so they're laughing at that. Yeah. Man. They looked at each other. They kind of caught each other's eye and they were, they were laughing and they asked Greg about it after the game. And he's like, yeah, I think we just, you know, we looked at each other and we just couldn't believe what was transpiring before our eyes. Like they were up four with 30 seconds to go. We come back. Trey has a shot to win it that he hits 19 out of 20 times and he misses it. And we're in double overtime. And then, in double overtime, Oregon just absolutely ran out of gas. They yeah, had basically they did. two guys scoring all their points, and they just Kusnard had done more than he has done his whole career in two games. I think he scored combined in the two games like seventy four points. It was absurd. Dante was a monster inside, Mister Glass, as I call him. But Mr. that was the best Glass. game of the tournament. the The best comeback of the tournament, the best comeback win of the tournament so far was Dayton against Nevada, down sixteen with. About six and a half minutes to go. Oh, yeah. They came back, hit a bunch of threes. Steve Alford, man, talk about a bum. You know, they had a former player was t roasting him on Twitter from UCLA, t basically saying that, like, you know, the guy's never made it out of the Sweet, six sweet 16. He's a loser. This is a former player. He said that he had... Talking about who? Uh, Steve Alford. Oh. And uh, the coach in Nevada. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was at UCLA. Yeah, he's at UCLA. And 
He has too much hairspray in his and it on his head that it's fried his oh please it's fried his brain beautiful hair for an old guy best not quite big dogs not but beautiful quite, not quite big dogs but i'll let you talk about this one too best comeback loss was absolutely last night if they completed it it would have been a top five all-time ncaa tournament comeback yeah a&M was down by 12 with a minute 51 to go and forced overtime. And I left your house at 3.30 to go when they're down 13. I said, this is over. I'm going home to go to sleep. I'll see you tomorrow for the podcast. And it took me about, I don't know, 17, 18 minutes to get home. And you called me like, you better turn this on. And there's still 52 seconds left. I mean, they played, it took 18 minutes for them to play two minutes legitimately. And I was like, oh yeah, it's a three point game. And I was like, oh yeah, they might play it out, play it out. I mean, just an absolute, I don't know what Kelvin Sampson's doing. For whatever reason, he doesn't like to foul it's at three. He wants to trust his defense. I'm like, you're the best fucking rebounding team in America. How about you just foul? Make him make the first. First of all, he has to make the first, which right. is 70% at best in college basketball. Last night, and it was just, 65. Yeah, yeah, and at best. 17 free yeah. throws. Get, and then get a fucking rebound and win the game. But no, he lets it play out. Let's him get a million shots off and then... Has somebody on the inbounder? Like I just I don't know what the hell he was doing. But it, with the with with there was only one point two, I get the fact it can be dicey that if you try to grab somebody, they're going straight up with it. So right I get there, that. Yes. But before that, he should have with three or four seconds left, he should have just fouled. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure he was probably his brain was fried after the comeback. I was like, I just want this. We're just gonna get a stop. We're gonna win the game instead of, you know relying on free throws and then he they've missed a ton of free throws all those guys are in foul trouble but I, yeah anyway it was a cluster that's yeah. for sure i mean it was a fantastic comeback by the aggies it was fun to watch i you know i made it in for the very end anyway. yeah they the the way it played out was crazy because if you look at a couple things on this game if you look at the free throw count in this game i think it was something like 45 to 26 or something and him shot 45 free throws but 16 of the free throws Houston shot were unintentional fouls. So legitimately, the foul, the free throw count was closer to, in the in the flow of the game, 45 or 46 to 10. It was one of the bigger free throw discrepancies I've ever seen in a game. Yeah. Now, with that said, Houston fouls in every fucking possession. And if you if you want to call it, you can. They're kind of like Tennessee. So a lot of them were fucking hacks. Oh, well, but, whoa, 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 whoa. But our volunteers play sound defense, don't they, we, Bailey? Move the feet. They that no, move the hands, move, move the, the hands, hands right move on the, the jersey. Feet, that big, the Rick the big, Barnes special. The Rick Barnes, the big backup for Tennessee. I don't know his name, but he does not play basketball. Like he forgets that he's on a basketball court. He just tackles motherfuckers. Out I there. do remember him getting called for a foul in that Texas game, being like, "What did I do?" And like it was like assault on the guy. <laughs> He turned around and was like looking at the referee, like threw his hands up. And I was like, dude, come on. You can't be arguing that one. Like it wasn't even close. Leg. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, they, but, they, they do that. So, but here's what I, I want to mention. Obviously heck of a comeback by A&M. Me and my dad watching that together. It was a blast. Cause we were like, oh my gosh. And I was texting a buddy who had Houston to win the whole thing. And Michael Freitas, who oh, yeah. has a he's in one in the bracket challenge. Yeah, right now, and I think. oh, actually, hilariously enough, I think that he got jumped. Hilariously enough, after the first weekend, Kevin McLaughlin, Kevin McLaughlin, but lost his national champ to Baylor Bears like yesterday in the second yep, round. Yep, yeah, devastating. Poor Baylor Bears, and he owes you fifty, he owes me a hundred. Yep. yep. Oh, Mister Mac. He asked me yesterday what I what he owed me for. Like he didn't remember the bets from two two days ago. I had to text him what he owed me for. But, but he was like, remind me exactly why I owe you a hundred dollars. Like we talked about this yesterday. I did we at lunch, but I, I will say incredible comeback by a and it was a blast to watch. And I, like I said, when I was talking to Michael, I said, look, they a hundred percent should foul here because I can tell you the way this has gone. It's like Murphy's law. What have, whatever could go wrong, did go wrong for Houston. And if you allow them to inbound the ball here, they're going to make a three. Like, I guarantee, yeah. I go, they're going to make it. It's not going to go to Taylor because they're going to overplay on him. It's exactly what happened. They left a guy who's not a shooter wide open at Taylor the Taylor launched that one before from, like, 80 feet. <laughs> Such what the hell? I was so like, what bad. are you doing? But, yeah, anyway. The second one out. was even worse, the rebound, yeah. the rebound put back. But here, I want to say this because you mentioned this earlier this year. You said this multiple times to your credit. Houston being in the Big 12, it's going to benefit them in the tournament. It's going to benefit them in a way that they haven't played those type of games over the course of a season when they're playing in the American. Yeah. And last night is the epitome of that because 
they blow a game like that, it is devastating. And in in years past, I truly believe they lose that game because they don't play a lot of close games over the course of a season when they're playing that American schedule. Like they might play one or two close games the whole conference year that like are like that at least. Yeah. They played a ton of those games down the stretch. Oklahoma came down to a buzzer beater. They had a game. TCU game, I think they lost the on a buzzer game, beater. They lost at the buzzer. Iowa State came down to the last few possessions when they were in in Ames. But the one game, and Kelvin Sampson said he referenced this in the timeout. He said, they played Baylor, and I remember this because I had a Baylor plus two and a half ticket. They were up 15 at halftime on Baylor on the road. Blow the entire lead, and with about 30 seconds to go, Baylor has the ball down by two, and they basically hold for the last shot, and they get an Misi, their big man, gets an and one with like 3.7 to go, and he's now got a free throw to win the game. The kid misses the free throw. Houston gets the rebound, pushes it, and Jamal Shedd bangs a buzzer-beating three. Yeah. And then they and so Houston thinks they've won now after blowing this lead. They review it. It doesn't count. He didn't yeah. get it off. So you go to overtime, and you're like, you got the fans in it. It's a rowdy place. Baylor's on fire. They got all the momentum. It just feels like Houston's going to lose. Baylor comes out and scores on the first possession. You're like, oh, here we go. We got this. Houston gets three stops in a row and three buckets and wins the game. And he said, look, when they got in the timeout, we've been here before. We did this against Baylor. We blew the lead against Baylor. I got in the timeout. I said, look, guys, we've been here before. If you saw the Houston players after that shot, I went back and watched it because I do that shit. I mean, they had guys like this, like just jerseys over their head. Like they had lost the game, yeah. basically. They were devastated. They were absolutely stunned that they were going to overtime. So for Kelvin Sampson and that group and for not having LJ Cryer, and by the end of overtime, they had one starter left. The entire team had fouled out, and they still won. The ball's on Jamal Shedd, dude. That dude has cojones the size of fucking Saturn. I mean, those are <laughs> massive fucking balls, dude. That last take where he went in and jump-stopped and shot that little floater, what a fucking shot. That kid's a stud. Absolute stud. I like Houston. I don't think they're winning a national title playing like that. But, man, I was really, really, really impressed with how they finished that game. That sharp kid was win. nailing shots last night, too. He had, like, 30 points. Career high. He was, he's been good he all year. Hitting him in the corner. And he makes, shoots, like, 85% from the line. Yep. So, yeah, I don't know. Houston's like, – they're a tough out. I can tell you the rest of the – everybody else in college basketball would like to see A&M win that game last night for sure. Yeah, I, I will say I was rooting for Houston in overtime – I was rooting for AM to come back because I wanted to see a good game. Yeah. It was phenomenal to see that, but I didn't I felt I felt bad for Houston. You know, that would be a uh A and M didn't deserve to win the yeah, game. They shot tough, yeah, tough way to lose. Yeah, shot sure. forty more free throws than the fucking team and, and still almost lost or almost won. Real quick, give me your biggest disappointment in round one. Who's the biggest disappointment for you in the first round? Kentucky. Kentucky. Just because I had them in our little game and they they blew it. Yeah. Uh and I mean, like I said, you know, the kid Gake, Goki, Gakey, whatever. He made a million. Goki made every shot he took. And, you know, but Kentucky didn't play well. Um, but, I mean, that being said, I was ha I was happy. I mean, I, I like to see the upset. So, I wasn't too concerned. So, I, I, I wanted Oakland to win that. I was cheering for him against NC State, too. But I would say biggest round disappointment has to be them, probably. A lot of people had them in their final four as well. So, my, my biggest disappointment Weirdly enough, and I agree with you, Kentucky, you, you could make a case for Auburn. They were fourth in the Ken Palm and losing the first round. They were, they, they, they had an argument for a, for a two seed and they lose in the first yeah. round. But actually the biggest disappointment for me was McNeese state. I, Oh yeah. They, they, they could have definitely been mine too. Because yeah. I had them in the, we both had them in the sweet 16. You had them in the game. We had, they obviously play in the Southland, which is a horrible conference. But like you, like you mentioned when we were talking about it, they were blowing teams out by 30 every night. They they got a good draw, I really thought. You know, they got Gonzaga, who is as down as they've ever been this year. And they come out, they're the third best three-point shooting team in the country. I mean, they couldn't hit the broad side of a fucking barn. I mean, if you're, it's like if you're throwing darts at a bar, it's like, they didn't just like miss the whole board. They went to throw the dart and dropped it backwards and it hit a girl in the face. Like it was that fucking bad. They couldn't buy a three. I think they they were five for 24 in the game and they started one for 14 and they had no shot. Absolutely no shot. I mean, that game was over faster than you could chug a Miller light. Like it was over in two seconds. It's fast. It folks. was, it was fast. real fast. Like I, like I blinked and it was 
15 to 2. I was getting chirped because um, you you were playing poker and I did a little work and then went to meet um, a couple friends to watch that one and uh, and a couple other games. And I had told them I had McNeese State in my Sweet 16. And th- those old guys don't know a lot about They're baseball guys. Don't know a ton about basketball. They're like, you bet McNeese to beat Gonzaga, you fucking idiot. I was like, dude, there's two 12s that beat a five, you know, Every year. pretty much, or at least, you know, whatever, 40% of the time. Two 12s well, won this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I, I, I should have had Grand Canyon instead of um, McNeese. And I turned my back on Grand Canyon. Remember, I had them you originally did. in the game. Turn my back you for on giving them because I got both mid-majors <laughs> to pull upsets yeah, in the first did. round. You did. Uh, and, uh, yeah, McNeese. Yeah, disappointing. They played horrible, like you said. They're a good three point shooting team. They couldn't make anything, so it's kind of that simple. <laughs> they're gonna have to. They're gonna beat Gonzaga, who's a better team on paper. You're gonna have to make some shots. Yeah. They did not make any shots. And that line was five. It closed five. It opened seven and closed five. There was a lot of money on McNeese there, and they yeah. And then and then Gonzaga's now in the Sweet Sixteen. Uh, also, and I don't want to spend... play. I mean, they they shot crazy against Kansas. I don't know if it'll continue, but I don't think it will. How about how about New Mexico? Yeah. What a, what was that? To, it's just another can't make a fucking shot. I mean, they just could not. And that's just, you know, I think in college basketball, like I said, that's what makes tournaments so great is like the NBA. Those guys are just professionals. They can score. Then you met, they're having a bad day. They still score in college when your shots aren't coming in. Things, you know, go bad real quick. Now Clemson's playing good ball though, right? Beat Baylor yesterday, played a pretty good game against Baylor. Obviously Baylor played better the last 10 minutes of that game, but Clemson was Better the first thirty for yeah, they sure. Were the better team, and they beat the hell out of New Mexico. So who do they play next? They have Arizona. Yeah, I mean, with the way I would think Arizona would win that game, I think Arizona is a better team. But if Clemson plays the way they did the first two games, it's going to be a tough game for Arizona. Well, that's going to be the the question of is Clemson this good, or did they I get don't hot? Think so if they, yeah, did they get hot for for one? Because sometimes right the time, team gets yeah. hot one in a week, location, one right, weekend, one yeah. week. Now you got three or four days off. It's kind of going to be a different situation. You're you're Everything also going to be re- at a much bigger talent disadvantage. Yeah. Like these other two games, like Baylor, yeah, you're at a talent disadvantage, but they are terrible defensively. New Mexico, yeah, probably pretty equal talent wise. And then you look at at Arizona, and it's like they're they probably like PJ Hall is probably the fourth best player on the floor, maybe the fifth best player on the floor. Like Arizona has the best three or four players on the floor at any given time. I also, uh, I mean, also we got to say we were we got to be surprised with the way. The ACC is playing just in general. Yeah, they're six and one in the tournament. Yeah, I mean, I don't count for Virginia, Virginia shouldn't fuck got in. We knew how terrible they they're were terrible. before, so <laughs> I don't count them. But crazy that Clemson's won both. NC State's won. You know, NC State had the benefit of you know playing Oakland, but Oakland played pretty decent against them. They won the game. They beat a Texas Tech team that plays in the Big Twelve. That's not great this year, but they still beat them pretty handedly. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the ACC is playing good basketball. Then you have Duke, who I thought. You know, I told people that I thought James Madison would beat him. I had James Madison in the 16, and Duke beat him by 40. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what it was, but yeah, I mean. I mean, Duke, to me. I did. They were playing the first game. They started a little slow against Vermont, then kind of steadied the ship. They're fine. But I didn't think they were capable of beating any like let anybody in the country, let alone James Madison, by me 40 either. points. Me either. They're playing way better than they have been. They look like shit at the end of the year. They were they lost to NC State in the tournament, and that was like before NC State got real hot. That was like game two or three of the run. Yeah. So I just, I don't know. I, I, I still don't buy the ACC. I do think North Carolina, if they play the way they did in the second half at in stretches against Michigan State, could probably come out of that region. I still think, I think it'll be UNC Arizona in that regional final to go to the final four. And I believe Arizona will be favored in that game. So I still don't think they're the favorite to come out of the region, but they would be the least shocking of the three. You know, they beat Duke all three times. They're, they're by far better than Duke Clemson. I I just don't see Clemson getting through Arizona. If they do, I would be shocked to see them get through North Carolina as well. It's just too tough of a back-to-back there in one little weekend. But yeah, the, the New Mexico one was real disappointing. Is there a team that you think, why? Why are they have? Why do they have Sweet Sixteen games in? De- uh, no disrespect to Detroit. <laughs> if we have any Detroit listeners out there, I'm sorry, but what are we doing ha- putting Sweet Sixteen games in Detroit? <laughs> like, because they're playing this downtown, right? And everybody knows that lives in Detroit. That most people live, you know, outside of town in the suburbs or whatever. And listen, maybe the city's turning around. The Lions look good. 
and I'm not, I'm really not trying to shit on Detroit. But we're giving sweet 16 bids to Detroit? Really? I'm like, let's see, Dallas, Texas, the Little Caesars Arena in Detroit, (laughs) Purdue. I mean, like, really? Yeah, talk about getting the short end of the stick. You got Los Angeles, Boston, Dallas. Congratulations, you're headed to Detroit (laughs) to play in the Sweet 16. I'll tell you what, those kids ain't going out of their hotel room other to go straight to the bus and back to the I don't know if it's that bad these days. I'm just saying that is bizarro world to me like that's like <laughs> we're doing that like the com- whoever's in charge of that i mean i don't know whose palms are getting greased they bring the sweet 16 to detroit michigan little caesar's arena like i would have been i'd be fucking pissed if i was in the midwest region <laughs> you're sending my tennessee volunteers to detroit so who's going there it's it's tennessee Det- creighton, creighton gonzaga and purdue well there's nothing much to do in purdue or tennessee or I mean, Tennessee's a real piece of shit, if we're being honest. Right, Bailey? Knoxville's a real oh, piece of shit. Beautiful town. So Omaha's great. Creighton. Yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I've never even been in Knoxville. But anyway. Yeah. You can get yeah, off to, to Detroit. <laughs> poor, poor guy. Uh, yeah. We're going to have to. I, I think they're going to need some, some, some good security over there. <laughs> I mean, I just, it's just one of those deals where it's like, you know, you kind of want to, <laughs> like, if you're fans of the team, like, oh, cool. We're, you know, oh, we're going to LA for the Sweet Six. We're going to Boston. We're going to Dallas. Like, oh, we're going to Detroit. <laughs> I mean, there are not many people that plan their vacations to Detroit. Speak you know, Jim yourself, Nance, dude. Jim Nance said it once, he said it a million times, like, San Antonio should host the Final Four every chance they get, which we do. Great, great host. Because, yeah, because everybody stays on the Riverwalk. You drink margaritas. And whether you think the Riverwalk's a piece of shit or not, it is a muddy little creek, like Charles Barkley says. There's plenty to do, and you can walk across the street. The infrastructure of it's great. It's going to be fantastic when the Spurs get their new arena down there. But, I mean, it's like Detroit. It's also like when they have the national championship game. And I know Houston's a big city, but, like, and it, it's fine. Houston's a fine city. But, like, NRG Stadium is out by the old Astroworld. There's, like, nothing. I, you, you know, think of it like going to the AT&T Center. Where it's like, there's nothing to do around the AT&T <laughs> Center, right? So, anyway. Yeah. Enjoy Detroit, Creighton, and Tennessee. <laughs> All right. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> what was the most impressive team before we talk about the Sweet 16? What was the more most impressive team beyond UConn? Look, I, I will say this about UConn. I'll be shocked if they don't win the national title. That's yeah. the best team I've seen in like a long time. Like we said, the only time. reason they don't have a chance, uh, they, they could lose, is because it's a single game. Right. And the tournament things happen. That's what makes but the tournament special. I'm not knocking it. I it don't is, want I don't want a series or anything. I'm fine However, with it. however, every year that the number one overall seed doesn't win the championship, which happens probably 95% of seasons, every time that happens, I look at it and I'm I'm kind of surprised in the moment unless it's in the final four. And then about 10 minutes after I think about it and I think, okay, yeah, I can see it. They had a hole here. They had a hole here. You know, eh, it makes sense. This team got hot. I, I don't see that. I don't see a hole in UConn. I don't see a team. I will be stunned, stunned if they don't win the national title. And that's with me picking Purdue in my bracket, which I did just purely out of the fact that I thought Purdue had the second best chance. And I didn't think that they were going to, I was going to have to anybody pick Purdue yeah. besides me. Which and I mean, I just picked Tennessee because I thought nobody thing. else would be on them. And I thought maybe like four would be on yeah. Purdue. And but so yeah, I think UConn's going to. UConn is unreal. But besides, ju- based on what you saw in the first two rounds, take UConn out. Who's the most impressive team to you that you've seen play? Beyond just like the whole season, just like what you saw this weekend. Where you're like, man, that team, if they got hot, could maybe beat UConn or maybe, you know, give them a game or, like, maybe win the national title if UConn got upset by somebody else? I mean, the... T- Do it. Duke? Oh, oh, I didn't think... That. I thought you were going to say Purdue. No, well, Purdue Purdue has the second best chance, but, like, most... Uh, you kind of said most surprising playing well, or do you just saying well, the I best? Just mean, I just mean... I mean, just, I'm just, just most surprised not, not, at a Duke because I didn't the most think they were going to yeah, No, I mean, they're the most know. surprising because I didn't think it either. I, I but think they, per, also, let's, they also I think beat a Purdue, 12 and a 13 listen, seed. Purdue obviously has the best chance to beat UConn just because they have a 7-foot... Ogre. 9, 
Yeah. Ne- Giant ne- fucking ne- ogre. Neanderthal out there. I mean, I, <laughs> he's huge. I mean, I, I don't know what to say. You know, Matt Painter went off on somebody in the press. It's like, I saw he's like, oh, you guys need to fucking take a quiz and know your basketball knowledge. I'm like, dude, look, if that guy was six foot three and played that way, you wouldn't pick him at the YMCA. <laughs> I, I, those are just the facts. I mean, I, I they said for how big, listen, for how big he is, I give him credit. The fact that he moves a little bit better. He gets a lot of fucking rebounds. He mo- for how big is he moves well, and he's shooting a much higher percentage from the free throw line, which is great. But I mean, to say that he would be good at basketball if he went seven foot five is just not true. <laughs> I mean, you know more about basketball than me, but I mean, if he wouldn't like say that guy was six foot nine, he would. He wouldn't play college basketball. Look, look, he wouldn't play college basketball if he was 6'11". He well, really, he I really mean, I don't, I, I, yeah, it's, I don't let me, know. Let me rephrase yeah. that. He wouldn't play Division One yeah. college basketball. He would be at a Division Two school. He'd be a great center for, you know, Shriner or Trinity. No disrespect to those. They're great Division Three schools locally, but uh, they're not quite Purdue or North Carolina. And there's a reason that North Carolina and Duke and all those places didn't recruit this kid because he's a fucking ogre. And all he does is drop the ball in the fucking hoop. And look, I do, I'll give him some credit. There are times when I see him shoot a hook shot. And now that I, it's, it's, I hate having to root for them. I'm, I'm rooting for them now because I picked them and I'm going to win the bracket if, if they win more than likely. And so I'm watching him and every time he shoots, I'm, I'm like, why the fuck are you, are you doing anything but shooting a layup? But to his credit, he has a little bit of a hook shot now that he can make probably 55 to 60 percent of the time which is decent for a big man i would say that's about like a good big man yeah but if you just like if that was his only attribute like if he was just a guy who was shooting the hook shots like that he's fucking bench a bench guy right like the whole reason he is people are enamored with him is because he is seven foot fucking four that is it and there's no other reason i mean matt painter was asked like what do you think about people who say that he's only good because he's tall? He said they shouldn't cover basketball. Well, if you think, Matt Pander, that Dak Eady is good not because he's tall, you shouldn't fucking coach basketball. Also, you lost to fucking St. Peter's, North Texas, and fucking Fairly Dickinson, okay? So why don't you shut the fuck up before you, you know, you, why don't you go win a national title? Otherwise, stop fucking talking. Because if you lose this game in the Sweet 16, that seat's going to get really, really hot. Oh, wait. I forgot they lost to St. Peter's and Fairleigh Dickinson, right? Both of them, and North Texas. They lost to— So they lost—was it St. Peter's the year before and then Fairleigh Dick- Dickinson first round? Is that how that was? Or is it first round, then St. Peter's? It was Fairleigh—it was it was St. Peter's in the Sweet, Sweet 16. 16. It was—oh, sorry. It was North Texas in the first round, St. Peter's yeah. in the Sweet 16. Then Fairleigh Dickinson, Dickinson in the last first year. Round. Yeah. So they've won—they had won two games in three years, and he was two and three in the tournament with losses to— Three, three, 13 or higher seats. So, yeah, shut the fuck up, Matt Painter. You don't know what you're talking about. I like you, Matt. Don't listen to him. And I'm, I, I, I'm rooting for Purdue. I'm not trying to be a dick to Purdue fans. I like Purdue. I mean, I don't like Purdue, but I'm rooting for Purdue. But that's just We also ludicrous. need to talk about the great officiating through this first couple Dude, weeks of the oh tournament. Oh, my God. Let, can I start, please? Because you know great this is my specialty. officials. You know this is my specialty. We respect officials. They they are the scum of the earth. So Absolute funny. scum of the you earth. You just legitimately hate officials. Determining outcomes of the game. Let's start with the first fucking round. On the first night of the tournament, when we had Samford prime to pull an upset over Kansas. And we have a clean block on the back end. Got a little little hand. Uh, excuse little, me? <laughs> yeah, it's <clean>. Please? <laughs> uh, oh, please. Mm, boy. Look, that was a horrific call. Determine the outcome of the game. One. We had... A call in the Creighton Oregon game where the guy what was it like was it the Creighton Oregon game where the guy called the ball out of bounds that wasn't out of bounds and then they oh no sorry that was Northwestern FAU Northwestern FAU the ball got hit out of bounds and it Northwestern recovered the ball but they had called it out on FAU and it was clearly in bounds and then they reviewed it and it was in bounds so they had to go to the possession arrow and gave FAU the ball with like a minute to was go Was it Northwestern they gave it to yes. or FAU? No, they gave it to FAU. I'm Uh-oh. saying it was the Northwestern game. They gave it yeah, to yeah, FAU. Yeah. It really screwed Northwestern. Luckily for us, John L Davis, you know, saved the day with that 
80 foot air ball. He's a baller. Man, what a decision there. Forgot how much time was left on the clock in an NCAA tournament game with five seconds to go. Big That's dog, hard to do. Big dog, big dog said he was going pro last year, right? Yeah, he is going pro. He'll the be greatest, playing in Lithuania. <laughs> the greatest talent assessor. What was what the, the the thing though I think we talked about the most this weekend about officiating. I don't think there's been like the Samford one was bad. I actually thought the Auburn the Auburn uh, Yale game, the one that that would have given Auburn a chance to tie the game even though he missed both. I thought that one was really bad as well. There was one other one I can't remember what it was that was the, that basically determined the outcome of a game that I thought was terrible. There were some mad calls in that Creighton Oregon game. But for the most part, I I think it's been there haven't been as many controversial calls this year. However, the reviews, the reviews are oh, out yeah. of fucking control, dude. I mean, it's like every five seconds we have to go look at it. Like if the ball is hit off somebody and anybody does, everybody just starts to do it. Here, look, go review it. It was off him. It was off him. No, it wasn't. The guy saw it. It's off you. Let's move on. And then they have to review the clock. And then they got to review whether it's a flagrant foul or not. And they got to review if the fucking tooth fairy flew down and, and goaltended the goddamn ball. It's every second, and I'm tired of it. Like, let them play basketball. We have enough stoppages with media timeouts, taking double media timeouts under 12. Big under Dog 16. also agrees with this take. He was saying that he's tired of the fucking reviews. Play ball. Play ball. Let them All play. Right. Play ball. Sleeper, uh, sleeper. My, my sleeper that could still win the national title that nobody's talking about is Creighton. I think they. Uh, I agree. I think they are a really, really tight group. I watched that post game with with McDermott. He had all four of those guys in there, which is rare. Normally, there's one or two of the stars. They yeah. all kind of were in there together. Very tight knit group, joking around, really in, you can tell enjoy each other's company. In a day and age where you you get a lot of these interviews where it's like this is the tightest team we've ever had, and it, they lose the game. It's like actually no, it's fucking not. You guys have been here for for four months, and you're gonna go leave if somebody offered you money tomorrow. You're not tight whatsoever. Shut the fuck up. But Creighton actually does seem like that type of group. Yeah, I think they all like McDermott. I think they like McDermott. I think they like each other. They were I really... laughing. McDermott was giving what's his name shit because he couldn't make a shot. Yeah, oh yeah, uh, Stephen Ashworth, the forty yeah. year old man, finally made it before halftime. It was like, oh, way to go, buddy. <laughs> Bad finally. beat of the first round was South Carolina Oregon first half under. Oh yeah, that had three quarters court, three truck. quarter court heave to go over. So who we're gonna go over Sweet Sixteen? Uh yeah, what were you gonna say? Is that what you're gonna say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking. I was pulling that up actually to see who, so, play, who was playing first. I've got it right here. But so first, we'll start with the East Region. This is on Thursday. We have the number one seeded UConn Huskies taking on San Diego State rematch of the national title from last year. UConn's an 11 point favorite. This is the fourth time ever, I believe, that national the national championship has a rematch in the following tournament. The last time it happened was 07 Florida UCLA. Florida won the national title. They also won the second meeting in 07. Uh, does San Diego State have a shot here? No, but I could... Just because they got beat in the title game last year, I could see them... I mean, I I, I would my, my gut tells me UConn beats them by 20, but I'm going to just go out on a limb and say San Diego State loses by nine. Okay. I think they're going to keep it relatively, I think it'll always be in that 9, 10, 11, 12 point range. That's my guess. I think it's going to be right there. 27. 27. It's not, I, we don't even need to talk about this. I mean, I, I definitely think UConn's going to win. Only thing, I mean, I, San Diego State does have some older kids on that team, and they did lose in the national championship game, and obviously they're going to be, I, I they'll play hard. They're not near as good. They're going to, I mean, they could definitely get killed, but I'm going to say, you fucking want. You're gonna I'm going to say, I'm going to say nine. You're losing by for 27. For fun. Yeah, I, I mean, take the alternate spread minus 21 and a half. They're, you're fucking covering that. Um, Definitely I'm, could. Uh, that San Diego State B, UAB, and Yale. That's how they've gotten here. Right? It's the same thing they did last year, right? This is the exact same thing. They only they actually pulled this upset last year. They beat Alabama. How many did they lose to by UConn last year in the championship game? Double digits. It was not close. I think it was 16. Yeah, I think that's what it was around there. I can't remember. So, I, I this isn't going to be close. We'll move on. Uh, UConn's going to roll. I'd be absolutely stunned. I, I actually think I would make the, the Huskies a favorite against the Spurs, the Wizards, and the Pistons right now. I think they'd be favored over all three of those teams. I think it'd be a real, real... Uh, Good battle between Wimby and, and Klingon down low. No. Um, Iowa State, Illinois. This is maybe the one I'm looking forward to the most in the first round. This is the other East Region matchup. This takes place Thursday night. Iowa State defeated South Dakota State 
in the round of 64. Backed it up by taking down a, a pretty good and hot Washington State team in the round of 32. Illinois got a much easier path. Got Moorhead State in the first round. By the way, they were tied with Moorhead State with 11 minutes to go and ended up fucking covering the number of 13 and a half. Then they got to play the worst offensive team in the fucking country, Duquesne, in the round of 32. The path for Illinois, obviously, easier. This game's in Boston. Yep. Does it matter who wins this game? I, I don't think it does. I would say no. I think UConn beats either one of them. But but I think Iowa State is who I lean, I lean here. What do you think? Yeah, I'd probably go Iowa State. I Man, Illinois didn't play a lot of defense, but it just... Shannon just goes off. It, I mean, dude, I, I think it's a, a coin toss game. I'd give the edge to Iowa State just because they play better defense. Yeah. I think so. I, I don't think I don't think Illinois has seen a defense like this all year. No. And I think Iowa State is playing even in that Washington State game where it looked like man their offense is not looking good. They got in a t- they were down like 10 early. Yeah. And in years past if that happens to an Iowa State team, they get in a hole like that. We saw it last year in the first round against Pittsburgh. They just could not climb out of the hole cuz they couldn't shoot. This team makes threes. They just do. They make threes, they make their free throws at a decent clip. They are they're clutch. They make big time plays, and their defense wears you down. And that's the difference. The only shot Illinois has is if Terrence Shannon Jr. goes for thirty seven. Like that's their only chance. Because I don't think Marcus Damask is going to have a good game. I don't think any of those guys are going to have a good game. I just think Shannon is a is a hard matchup for anybody. I think he might be the most dynamic player in the country, and. He will give them a chance, but I think this is where Illinois' road ends. Underwood's been real bad in the tournament. This is actually the first time Illinois has been to the Sweet 16 since 2005. They had not been out of the first weekend in 18 years, 19 years. That's crazy. It's crazy. That was the year they went to the national title and lost to Tyler Hansbrough in North Carolina. But, yeah, I like I like Iowa State here. I already bet them. Um, I just – it'd be a great game. That would be one of the better games of the weekend. Uh, we'll go over. You got anything more on that game? No, I just think, like I said, I think it comes down to defense. Shannon, like you said, I think he's going to have to score at least 30 if they win. That'd be my guess. Somewhere yeah. around there. We'll go over to the West region in sunny Los Angeles, California. We're at 840 Central Standard Time. We got the number one seed in the West. UNC taking on number four, Alabama. Alabama, a little bit of a surprise to be here. They are a four and a half point underdog. The total on this game is a whopping 173 and a half. Going to be a lot of points here. Going to be a fast paced game. UNC looked really, really bad at the beginning of the game against Michigan State. They and did. It felt like, oh, here we go with fucking Izzo in March again. Izzo in fucking March. Yeah, I thought they were going to win. The start, at the start of that game, it looked like they were going to win it. So they, uh, and then went on a crazy run. I think it was like 24 to two or yeah. something crazy before halftime to go up. Were they up nine at halftime or something? I think they were up eight or nine. They were down. They went from down 12, I believe, to up nine. Yeah, something crazy yeah, like something that. Yeah, something like that. They, they, crazy. They did not Crazy look run. And, you know, it was like a home game for them. That obviously helped, right? I mean, Michigan State had some fans there, but that was, was it in Charlotte, that region? Yes. Yeah, so that's the uh, benefit of being a home team there. Get to basically play at home, use the crowd, and... um Good win from them. Yeah, I mean, I, when when Michigan State went up like early, I was like, oh, here we go again, like you said. But um, I Alabama's just too one-dimensional with Sears, man. I think North Carolina will be fine. Could have very easily lost to Grand Canyon last night. They were down by three with about five Say and a half to North go. North Carolina by eight in that one. By eight, eight? Or, eight or nine, yeah. I already bet North Carolina as well. Small, because I don't trust them. But I just don't trust Alabama more. Grand Canyon demolished them on the offensive glass, and then they just ran out of gas the last five minutes is what it felt like. They they yeah. also Ray Harrison basically like speaking of dumpster fires, one of fucking eleven. I think he missed 17 threes in a row in the tournament and just fucking kept firing him like shoot yep. shoot or shoot, shoot baby. Or shoot, baby. Fucking launch that bitch. Shoot or shoot. Shooting step back threes on his 17th straight miss. I was he like, caught- this kid's got some fucking cojones. Or Mr. Mac. But, um... Ray J. Or, or is it Ray J? No, no, no. That's that's Ray J's from... That's Baylor. 
I'm oh, talking about. I'm talking, talking about, about Harrison. I'm talking about Ray Harrison. Got it. Fuck got the kid it. from Ray J was bad too. Though. Well, Ray J was fucking horrible. Yeah. Of course, Ray, he ended up with 27 points because he took too. 29 shots, and my dad's like, "See, he had 27 points, bitch. I told you it was good." Yeah. Your dad was like, "That's my, boy. that's my boy. He's my, going, well, he's going pro." Why was he his boy? Because you don't like him. There you go. That's exactly right. That's the only reason. And he assesses talent. That's he like doesn't that kid, like that kid from Providence who's going to the league. Yeah, the guy that's working construction now. That was so funny. <laughs> he's like, he lo- wait, that one, it was that last year he saw him make the layup. He's like, that guy's going That pro. guy's going pro. He comes off the bench, plays two minutes a game. That guy's going pro. UNC top 10 defense and schedule adjusted defensive efficiency. Alabama outside the top 100. Give me, give me the Stat Tar Heels. Stats. Stats, Mats, but give me the Tar Heels by seven. Okay. Seven. Seven. The, uh, t- let me, let me, let me rephrase that. Tar Heels by 10. Charles by that one by double digits. R.J. Davis will have a, a good game. He didn't shoot it well. Uh, second game in sunny Los Angeles. We got Arizona taking on the surprise in the region. The number six seed Clemson Tigers. Arizona's a six and a half point favorite. Wildcats in Clemson's run here, in my opinion. Don't think that. Uh, don't think Clemson's going to continue this little hot streak. I know they played good at the beginning of the year. They played good at the beginning of the tournament. I think it's going to be similar to their season. Play good at the beginning. Get to the middle. Throw up all over themselves. I just think Arizona is the second most talented team in the country behind UConn. They are actually damn near close. They also have two kids who played in national titles. They got Keyshawn Johnson from San Diego State who played the championship last year. And they have Caleb Love who played in a championship two years ago. So they have some experience there. Tommy Lloyd's a fucking choking ass little bitch. But I do think <laughs> I do think Arizona is going to take care of Clemson. Yeah, like we talked about, a lot of times you play good the first week and doesn't carry over to the second. And Arizona's got way more talent, so right. I'd expect them to win it. I'll say Arizona by ten. 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 Okay. Did I say? It did seems I... like all the favorites have been winning lately. So. I know. I, I'm kind of scared of that, but the favorites went 15 and one straight up, uh, 12 and 12, three and one against the number in the second round. I, I'll say Arizona by 14. I think they're going to absolutely kill them. I hope I'm wrong because I want to see some of these games be good games. Houston versus Duke. Houston, a three and a half point favorite. Can't believe the line is this short. Thought it was going to be at least five and a half here. I think Duke's being just because how well, yeah, right, how well they, they played. And Houston's too physical for Duke. Yeah, and I think people are going to see that that Houston almost blew it to A&M, and that Duke annihilated and covered. And more importantly, both those numbers. Yep. And I think we're going to see a lot of public money on Duke here, and I think Houston is going to. Beat them by, I, man, th- this this seems like the same matchup last year when they lost to Tennessee. Remember when I bet Duke in that game? They just got absolutely oh, annihilated yeah. in the second round. I think that's going to be, I think I, I legitimately, this is weird to say, I think it's going to be like 17. I think they're going to beat them, physically just beat them up. I don't think they'll be able to score on Houston. I'll say Houston by eight. Eight. But yeah, I could see them. Like Duke's just not. Yeah, I mean Houston plays a football game out there on on the court, and yeah. just depending. But it depends how the game's officiated, obviously. Because Last if year, they call if they yeah, yeah but they it depends it like what the they A&M want. Game. If they if they call it where they're getting Duke all the fouls that A and M got, then uh, yeah, well it'd be a real tight game. But I still you, think Houston can fin- find a way to win. Usually, the farther we go in the tournament, not always, but usually the farther we go, the less we get officials making a lot of calls. Usually yeah. it's starting to get more loose and allowing more contact. I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, this, uh, where's this one? Dallas. Yeah. Dallas second game in Dallas Marquette. Number two seed finally got the monkey off their back and got through the sweet, got to the sweet 16, taking on the Cinderella of the tournament, uh, NC state Marquette's a six and a half point favorite dude. I, I have written down here on my notes. I, I wrote Marquette rolls in this one. But I'm going to change this. I'm actually going to predict that NC State pulls the upset, not because I think they're going to win, but because I want them to lose. And I think if I, I think if I pick them here, I will reverse jinx them and force them to lose this game because I'm so annoyed that they even made the fucking tournament. And by the way, winning a tournament game or two does not prove that you deserve to be in the fucking tournament, okay? If you took the top eight teams who missed the tournament and put them up against, you know, six to 11 seeds... Two or three of them would fucking win. So it just, this means nothing to me that they won two games. All right. And they beat fucking Texas Tech, who's injured as shit, had two starters out from the end of the year. And then they beat fucking Oakland, 
It was the surprise of the tournament. Like, they've, they beat nobody. So I really hope Marquette just fucking steamrolls them. I just don't see it. Marquette Give doesn't me. seem to blow people out. And NC State just is that hot. I'm tired of picking against them. I'm going to pick them to win. So at least if they do win, I look smart. And if they lose, I could be like, fuck yeah, I caused this. <laughs> a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, I will take the second coming of Big Baby Davis, Burns, and the Wolf Pack. Just because I'm tired of them, too. And if me and Dylan pick the same team, there's no way they win. So <laughs> We were both on New Mexico. We were both on McNeese. We were both on Sanford. Yep. All of them lost. All of them in a we bracket. Did, we did get JMU loss. in the first round. We both oh, got yeah. JMU. We were, we were, oh, we we're okay there. All and right. then, they got, then they lost by 100. So Yeah, only, only by 47. All right, on to the best region of the tournament as we travel to... Beautiful Detroit, Beautiful Michigan. Beautiful Detroit, Michigan, where the Purdue Boilermakers take on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Is that the Bulldogs? Yes. Yeah. Yes, the Bulldogs. yes, it is. Another line I absolutely could not believe. I bet Purdue last night at four and a half. It's already moved to five and a half. Got in front of that line move. And I think Purdue, I, reading these, reading my notes of these games, I've, I think I've said this team's going to wax this team in every game. It's just, these are going to be the, the closest game we've ever seen. Like, uh, I, I I take Purdue to win this game by twenty. Uh, not sorry. Let me let me rephrase that by ten. I think Gonzaga will shoot the ball well enough to to make it close enough late. But look, this Gonzaga team has been down all season, and they have no one who can guard Edie inside. It's going to be target practice for the guards. They already struggle to defend the three point line. Give me Purdue by ten. Give me the Zags by three. Wow. I'm tired of fucking Purdue. Get them out of the tournament. Nobody wants to see them there. Wow. Yep. You know what? Zags by... Beat, uh, you know they beat McNeese and Samford, right? That's who Gonzaga's beaten so far. Yeah. Those are, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. McNeese and Kansas. Those are fantastic teams. Can Kansas without McCullers. Um, How much? By three. By three. Close game. Close game. Who's the guy you hate on Gonzaga? Hickman? Fucking hate no He's going to hit a three on you to end it. If he to does send, that, I'm swan diving that. off the Tower of the Americas. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Not for not for losing the bracket challenge. No, that's how much I care about this thing. Yeah. I'm, a comp- I'm a true competitor, all right? It's, it's true win or die. competitor. Win or die. Uh, yeah, no, I... Purdue will probably win, but I'm, I'm sticking to my guns. I'll take Gonzaga. Hickman by three. For that, as and move. honestly, Gonzaga, I just think that it may be one of those years that everybody's talked shit about them all year that they're no good, and then they just this could be the year where they can't go to the Final Four and like damn well near. I, I said they that can't at the beat, beginning yeah, of the tournament. I don't think they can beat UConn, but uh, they if they keep listen, they keep what if UConn if they, gets upset by somebody yeah, and they keep shooting the way they did against Kansas? They, I don't know if anybody will beat them. Yeah, but that won't. I I can't imagine that happening for f- four more games, but. I just think everybody picked against them in the last two games, and I, th- and I think that in this game, everybody's going to be on Gonzaga, knowing Purdue's history, and I think Purdue is on a mission this year to get to a championship, at least to a Final Four. Yeah, I, no. be, I, I really would be surprised if they don't get to a Final Four. I agree with you. But just for, just for you doing that, I was initially leaning towards Tennessee, but but the second game in beautiful beautiful Detroit Michigan. Yes. Give me fucking Creighton. Give me give me the you can, you can have them. <laughs> give me the white boys to take down the great. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that. The great white hope Dalton connect. And, That's hilarious. Yeah. And, yep. and great uh, white hope. I like I like Creighton in this matchup. I think Creighton survived a, a miracle ending that they probably should have lost. And when teams tend to have those games that they should have lost and win. They go on and, and they're loose the rest of the tournament. And I think Creighton's going to find a way to win this. Also, Tennessee's just shot the ball horrifically. Like that game, I told you my lock of the tournament was the first half under in Texas and Tennessee. And oh, yeah. it went under by 27 points. So I, I think, I think Creighton's going to win here. I think it'll be the best. This game in Iowa state, Illinois will be the best two games of the, of the, of the round of uh, 16 or the sweet 16. Uh, I'm going to pick Creighton here too. You like how I did that? Fuck off. You're doing that yep. so, you, so, you, so that Tennessee doesn't, will win. Doesn't matter. No, I'm picking no, no, Creighton. No, no. That's my official pick on no. the podcast. He can't change his pick. As Big Dog would say, thank you, please. That's I, I it. No, this. no. You've already picked Creighton. You've already picked them, and I've picked them too. Can I talk? Book it. Blue Jays. Can lead I, hate. Can I talk? First of all, if you're doing this on purpose, 
it's not going to work. Oh, yeah, it will. Secondly, <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> secondly, and I told you this before, I'm really starting to not like you very much. Beautiful. That's what we need. That's what you need in a podcast. I'm, I'm two people that really, hate each other. You're it's, becoming uh, the it's Mad Dog Russo and um and uh, Stephen A. It's, yeah, you're, skip you're, bec- you're becoming the character Big Dog wants you to be, and I'm not liking this. I told him this this weekend, and he died Show, laughing. Showbiz. Starting to not like her Uncle T very Creighton much. by a million. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, we got our picks for the Sweet 16. We can talk. Real, let's talk. The good news for you is I didn't. I, I gave you a chance with Purdue. I picked Gonzaga. I could have picked Purdue, too. I didn't do that. I'm a gentleman. I gave you a chance to win the game. Now, Creighton. You're a bitch. Creighton, you, you shouldn't have picked first. That's your fault. I just wanted to pick Creighton out of spite of the fact that you picked against fucking Purdue, and then you fucking turned it around on me yep. and stole Genius. my thunder. Genius. I'm not liking this. I So those are the Sweet 16. What is uh, anything else? Oh, other sports-wise, we got Otani betting $4.5 million yeah. and all kinds of stuff. That's interesting. What's up with that? Allegedly, it's well, allegedly, obviously, it's a translator. Everybody knows that. It's not the translator, folks. Translators now get $4.5 million credit lines. Okay. Preach. So that is uh, Otani gambling. I personally, I really don't think he was gambling on baseball. I think he was gambling on other shit. Um, and him and his buddy have known each other like forever. And people are in the media are trying to switch this to his interpreter, lied on his resume about going to like some shitty. Cal State's Northridge or something and then work for the Red Sox when in reality the only reason the translator and Otani work together is because they've been friends forever. So it's maybe Otani told him to lie on his resume just so he could get the job with the Angels. I have no idea. Maybe he had to have some kind of experience so they'd be like, okay, we'll bring him in because he's done this before. And Otani's like, no, nah, I'm going to bring this guy in. But what's hilarious about the Japanese, and this is 100% true, is when they have these translators, okay, these guys speak English. Like, Otani speaks English. They've already been on. Same thing with Hideki Matsuyama. His caddy is his translator, and then he has another guy that's his translator. He speaks perfectly good English, but he does it so he doesn't have to do two interviews. Ah. So he smokes. Yes, he speaks to the Japanese media and says, oh, I only speak in Japanese, and someone will translate it so he doesn't have to meet with both medias. And they're like, Someone was talking about who's the funniest, like on the course and PGA Tour is like underrated funny is like Hideki, Hideki uh, Matsuyama. And they're like, really? He didn't, sp- I thought he didn't speak English. Like, he fucking speaks English. <laughs> you just don't want to talk to the fucking media. It's the same thing with Otani. You have these guys, so you don't have to speak, you don't have to, you don't have to do media responsibilities. <laughs> And you have your, and think about how cool it would be, be like, oh yeah, I'll just have my best friend around all the time in the fucking dugout to shoot the shit with for 162 games. Why would you not yeah. have a translator? The team, even if you paid him out of, he makes so much money, pay him out of his own pocket, but the team pays the guy. Right. So that's like uh, the Dodgers fired. It would be hilarious if Otani was like, yeah, I'm only playing if he comes back. I'll pay him. <laughs> and he's in the dugout all season. Someone said one of the best comments I've read on this is like, it'd be hilarious in perfect English if he was like, I got Iowa State next week minus one and a half. And it's like, <laughs> like walked off the podium or something. But yeah. But he's not um, betting on baseball, right? No, I, I don't believe so. And there's been an investigation done on this. Apparently, it's been going on since January. And even in the last year, it all stems from a casino host that was at Resorts World and right. our executive there. Sorry, not casino host. And a lot of people got busted in uh, California. And, you know, through the investigation, they saw these bank wires trying to figure out, like, how much money has been laundered or whatever it was. And they noticed it was coming from Otani's accounts. And I'm sure they did you know, some kind of investigating on like, okay, you know, yeah. is he betting? Well, maybe they, I, I'm sure they didn't, but I'm just saying along the lines of like, they knew it came from them. The MLB's fine with saying they're, they're just going to sweep it under the rug, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, even if he did bet on baseball, which I really don't think he did, but say he did, I MLB will still cover it up. Hundred percent because he's, he's, he's it would be he's too massive important. Loss oh my god! Yeah, he's, he he is baseball right now. They're not gonna be like, oh yeah, you can't play anymore. Now I could absolutely see him betting on 
the Nippon League, which is in Japan, which he used to play on, he could be betting on that for yeah. sure. And he knows probably everybody in that league. Why so, would he risk doing that if he's going to make so much money? Then? No idea, dude. I but I mean, it's, it's yeah. He I can mean, go to Vegas and gamble on other things. Like, yeah. you know, it's like you don't have to bet on sports or, or you know, I, I don't know. I just don't get that. Yeah. It's, it's weird. But I mean, I, I just don't buy the story. The, the reason I really don't buy it is because if they would have just stuck with a story that, hey, it's my translator's just gambling like fish. Right. I mean, it was $4.5 million over th- this oh, over this time period, and I've paid it off for them, and they didn't change that story. It's a very believable story. Right. That's fine. But when you go, oh, wait, actually, the next day, he stole it from me, and then the Dodgers fire him <laughs> after we were with each other the day before, yeah. laughing and giggling, and he addressed the team and told them, the fall guy story right. more than likely and did that. So I, I don't know. It could have been his translator. I really don't think it's, you know, I really don't think he's betting on baseball. So I really don't think it's going to ultimately be a big deal at all. So, um, but I am curious. I think there's a presser at some point today and I hope he speaks perfect English and it'd be amazing. <laughs> it's like he does speak English. So oh, man. it's hysterical. Oh, I wanted to, I know this is going backwards a little bit. I wanted to talk one thing about the they opened the portal yeah. in college basketball before the tournament. You had like that's that's crazy to me. You already have like like a hundred kids more than that in the portal already. I mean, I'm going down a list right here. I'm looking at the top fifty kids already in the fucking portal. We're at uh here's a hundred, a hundred fifty. I mean, we're we're talking like three, four, five hundred kids in the yep. portal already. Ranked, already ranked here. Like you know, most of these kids are undecided. How long do we know how long they have to make this decision? Do they get like, is it like football? Don't they only, football only got like, like what, two weeks or a couple weeks? I think it's two. I thought it was supposed to be two weeks, but okay. it may be a month. I'm not sure, but I just don't know why you would open it before the tournament. That doesn't make any sense. Um, we have apparently that the number one, apparently the number one transfer guy is Maxime Reynaud, who is from Paris, France, but he played for Stanford last year. Huh. He was transferring. I don't know. There's I've never from, heard of him. Oh, dude, two of the kids. There's that's crazy. There are two kids from Stanford who are the top two of the top three. I'm sure as we go through these teams getting out in the tournament, we're gonna have more better players enter. But right yeah. now, those are the top two of the top three. Rutgers has a kid. O- Okie State has a kid. Brandon Garrison. Anyway, yeah, I just think it's crazy to me that, that this day and age, like. We're gonna we're gonna not only have no rules, have it be the wild wild west, allow all these things, and then also, by the way, you guys coaches who are in the tournament, we're gonna open the transfer portal during the fucking NCAA tournament, That's... so that now you not only have to worry about trying to win a national title, you can worry about trying to keep your fucking players at the same goddamn time. I mean, it's idiotic. It is absolutely absurd. This is ridiculous. The NCAA, they had something has to be done about this. I mean, it's just. It's out of control. It's it's absolutely yeah. out of control. And the transfer portals are in NIL. It's all getting out of hand. Um, Dusty May went to got hired by Michigan. Yeah. Vanderbilt hired the JMU coach. Yeah. We had Ohio State already hired Jake Diebler, who had been their interim coach. He played at Ohio State, so we've had a couple coaching changes in in there. We got the NFL draft coming up. I know we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. How about the Chargers getting rid of both of their top receivers? Got rid of Mike Williams yeah. and Keenan Allen. They must be going for a receiver now in that first yeah. one. Yeah, you would think so. Thought they were going to go for the trenches for sure. Yeah, well, everybody did. Yeah, everybody thought they were going to take Joe Alt. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what they're going to end up doing. Last thing, NBA, real quick. Should we? Do we even need to talk NBA today? Uh, Wimby twisted his ankle. He's not playing the night. That's the only NBA news you people need. <laughs> There's nothing else to talk about. No, no one gives one a shit. Thing. Wimby's Wimby's. The, Wimby is this league at this point, okay? There's one other thing. On the 15 and the, 70 Spurs. The or whatever, Spurs are hanging on to that third to last spot. Oh, yeah. We and need the to bottom keep three get 14%. 12th yep. get, or fourth, fourth to last gets 12.5%, yep. and fifth gets 10%. So we're only two games in the loss column, I guess, behind, but really ahead of, I believe it's the Wizards or the Wizards ahead of us. Maybe it's the Hornets. Regardless, we're we're right there. We really need to hang on. So Wimby needs to nurse that ankle injury for a couple weeks so we can lose, you know, 17 out of 17 instead of 14 out of 17 because Wimby will single-handedly win us three or four games. But we, we need yeah, to we should Yeah, we should be good two games behind the Hornets. But. I, I do want to say it is crazy. I was looking at the standings last night just, just out of curiosity. 
because this is all we're going to have after the next couple weeks. The Lakers and the First of all, show some fucking respect. Opening day is on Thursday, okay? Baseball? America's pastime. Yes, baseball and hockey playoffs. Hockey me, playoffs are awesome. Hockey but, playoffs are great. But right? to talk about baseball like it's even remotely fucking interesting. It's the Lord's game. I would rather watch. I would rather watch. I, I'd watch Moneyball every night of my life oh my over watching. We know the you'd rather game. watch women's college basketball. We Dude, know. I would. I would. We it's know. Way more we interesting. Know. We know. Bailey. Do oh, you by the way, why don't, Would you rather way. watch a baseball game or women's oh, college ba- basketball? No, Bailey's a baseball man. Yeah. Do you really? Yes. Oh God. Please. You, you two are. Wait, you talking about MLB or or college? Wow, I'm See, shocked. Bailey, you're you're a good man. You don't even watch baseball. You just watch yeah, the fucking game I watch, cast. No, I watch Astros. Oh god. No, I really do. No, please. Like, I mean, no, oh, I do. Please. I do. Yeah, I like I, I watch the Astros. Please. But which you don't I watch actually, the Astros, which I actually please. don't know what's gonna happen because uh, with the whole Bally Sports stuff, I don't know what's gonna happen this year with that. By the way, but for those at home, Amazon that don't Amazon's know this, it over. yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're as far as what they're gonna do streaming wise. But um. Fun fact for you kids at home, by the way, I learned about this last year. If you do have T-Mobile and you do like baseball, you get the MLB package for absolutely free on your phone. You just sign up for it. If you have T-Mobile? Yeah. You get it for free. For free. MLB.TV. Not MLB Network. MLB.TV. You watch any game on your phone. Any game. How is that possible? It, just have, so, like I have, have T-Mobile. I'll show you how to do it. And then you can, like, if you, I mean. Well, I, I'm going to need you to talk a little bit about yeah, baseball. But, yeah. So, you could have it set up on one of your TVs that you stream on huh. and you can put any game on. It's great. That's or if it's on cool. your phone, the MLB.TV apps actually, if you do like baseball, it's a great app. These are up, click it, comes on your phone or I used to watch it on an iPad, but um, yeah, I, it's a $175 value that they give you for free because the partnership huh. with uh, major league baseball, That's badass. but you have to sign up. I, I'm going to need to do it. I just remember that you have to sign up either like today or tomorrow and you only have like a week to sign up. So they, oh. they, it seems like they try to get people to miss it. So yeah, I mean, they I don't, don't, but yeah, the partnership is, yeah, it's free MLB.TV, which is just like league pass or anything else. So that's crazy. Um, and then why don't you talk a little bit about your girl, Caitlin Clark end of the second round, end of the second round, baby. Who are they playing today? They are playing West Virginia. Okay. We can't, we can't wait. They're 15 and a half point. Okay. Favorites. Right. Okay. And they are the number one seed in their region. Mm-hmm. So they're going to get West Virginia. And then I believe I have to look back up at the bracket, but I know basically they look to be on a collision course with LSU. <laughs> Your okay? dad just texts me, wrap it up. <laughs> of course. He's, at, he's already driving to Port Aransas. <laughs> he's out there to Port Aransas because he's text Bailey. He's like, no, oh, they're still shooting because he's got something for Bailey to do. It's just like, wrap it up. I'm going to text back. Dylan is recapping the women's tournament. <laughs> Damn straight I am. They just, yeah. Uh, Look, after Iowa dismantles West Virginia tonight, yes. Mm-hmm. next week on March 30th, they will take on Colorado, who beat Kansas State yesterday. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And after we take down, after we take down Colorado, then we're going to get the winner of LSU and UCLA more than likely. And, and it's if they play LSU in a rematch, I'll watch just because there's bad blood. There you go. But I won't watch them if they play anybody else. If they make it to the national championship, play South Carolina. Are they on different sides of the bracket? They are on different sides of the bracket. Yeah. Yes. So like if they played in the national title, I'd watch. And if they do play LSU, I just know that uh, what was it? The Angel Reese girl was talking shit to Caitlin Clark. Your mom, your mom was telling me she hates LSU. It was cracking me up. <laughs> Wait, you know my mom's become like a basketball fan. No, now. I I know it's she crazy. And you got her that little Caitlin Clark T-shirt jersey for That's Christmas. Right. Yeah, she was sporting that the other day. She actually watches basketball now. Even some of the guys' games, I'm shocked. Uh, yeah, but you wouldn't even watch if if they played the Final Four and it wasn't LSU or South Carolina. You wouldn't watch it. If it was the final four, yeah, probably. Okay, there we go. But I would rather them. I'd rather them be playing LSU. It'd so, be more. Sure, sure. Are we gonna have like like the way we do the men's? No, I'm watch definitely party? not. No, are definitely gonna a, not. Are you and me gonna have a watch party? No. Out of respect for I'm all that's good you, in the world, and ba- uh, that you saying you'd rather watch women's basketball than God's game baseball, I can promise you, I'm not coming over to the watch on that. On the final four, I'm gonna I'm going to call you. And I'm gonna tell you that you're gonna update I'm, me. No, no, I'm gonna call you, and I'm gonna tell you like. I'm going to make something up like, hey, 
we're playing a poker game and like I won I won a lotto a, the lottery and I'm gonna splash the pot for a million dollars and we're all gonna play and I get you to come over and then I'll be like ha just kidding we're gonna watch the final four together yeah and you're gonna be like wait what the fuck we're not and then I'm gonna drive basketball. ten minutes home that's right <laughs> it's no, gonna I'll be brutal it's gonna be brutal I'll set Jude on you who almost attacked oh you last God. night <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about Jude live on the air yeah here, because let me tell the you. disrespect that Big Dog would take from you would not be much. No, well, Big Dog, I, I had a respect for Jude. I, I won't talk shit about Jude because of your mom, because she really loves Jude. Your dad doesn't actually believe Jude's the smartest dog in the world. Uh, thank you for saying that. He doesn't. There's no way he does. Because she it's knows just, there's something loves, wrong with her. No, he loves Jude, and Jude's very sweet and, you know, will sit there and lick you for 45 minutes. Very <laughs> sweet dog. But he ain't the smartest dog in the world. <laughs> That's Who's all I'm saying. the smartest dog in the house? Uh, um, fucking Brooklyn. No, I knew you were going to say that. It's Westbrook. It's not even close. Brooklyn. Dude. By the way, we're bringing Brooklyn on the pod. I would like that. That'd be funny, actually. We, we, what we should, should do is, shaking. what we should do, yeah, we should be bouncing around <laughs> here. Um, Yeah, but we'll bring soon, guys. We're going to bring the dog. Everybody can meet the dogs. And then the big dog will be back next week. <laughs> he's made a promise. He's not and he's got back. quite the segment for you guys. You're going to have to tune in to see it. And you'll get to meet Brooklyn soon, the Chihuahua with an ear and a half. There's one ear holding on by a thread. Westbrook and then Westbrook, is- Westbrook's a great dog. She'll chill. Westbrook reminds me of uh, Joe Rogan's got his dog in there for the podcast, like at all times, and he's doing the podcast. And you can see guests petting the dog. There and it's go. just That's the dog walking around the room. Right. It doesn't make, it, doesn't make any noise. No. Problem with Westbrook okay. is... She does have some gastrointestinal problems occasionally. This um, room would be some yeah, it would be stinky. It's, um, yeah. she, dude, she yacked all over my carpet last Ugh. night. It was disgusting. I I was I was actually trying to go to sleep early, like at three o'clock, and she yacked all over the carpet. Three I got to bed at four thirty. I got to bed at four fucking thirty uh, because I had to clean this fucking throw up up, and I could not get the smell out. And then I almost started threw up because it was so bad. God, it, I yeah, not not good, but. And your dad just put, no, now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that wraps it up. Yeah. Uh, we'll, got, we'll be back next week on Monday if we can because they'll, we'll have to recap the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. And we'll Mark your calendars. Mark your calendars. Big Dog's back. Big Dog will not be here. Big Dog's week. back. No, he will not. He will not be on the podcast. Uh, this has become we're, – we're, we're getting into a groove together, and it's been a good show. We're going to have some new guests on soon. Now that we have nothing else to talk about, but no, Big Dog. Bailey worked really hard on the Big Dog song, dude. All right? (laughs) He doesn't even like it. A Big Dog song is awesome. What do you mean? All right, thanks for tuning in. Make sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Check out our clips channel as well, where we post short clips and our short videos. Check out my website, www.dillonleaksports.com. Get some free sports betting picks, sports articles. And follow us on social media at SlobPod on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a follow there. But of course, above all, give us a a subscribe on YouTube. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Amazon Music or Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll be back next week talking more March Madness. The year of sports is coming to an end. It's a depressing time, but we're here to lift your spirits, and we will continue to do that regardless of how many you actually listen to this. So thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next week. Signing off for Coach Leak and Uncle T. Not Big Dog, though. (laughs) No Big Dog.